calling for change. Multiple lawmakers from around the Capital Region speaking out against the ongoing practices of the asylee program. We'll chat with Congressman Mark Molinaro about the recent controversy surrounding the state's handling of this influx of migrants. Hi everybody and welcome to Empire State Weekly. I'm Ryan Peterson here in Albany. As the migrant situation continues to unfold, frustrations are growing. Albany lawmakers speaking out this week against the company hired to care for and transport these asylum seekers around the state. The lawmakers allege that the company, DocGo, is not sharing information with them on multiple levels, including when migrants will arrive, how many will be arriving, and if they will have school-aged children with them. They also say the company is failing to provide essential medical care. Governor Hochul saying a review has been launched to make sure the company is meeting its obligations. Let's look at it two ways. One is there have been a large number of people where there have been no incidents, no reports of anything that has not been working out well. So that is on balance. What we're hearing is that there's a lot of it going right. But also there's cases where incidences have risen, been reported on, that are deeply concerning to me as the governor of the state. DOCGO has responded to the claims, refuting that they have not been in contact with local leadership. They do, however, say that they have, quote, assembled a team to look into these assertions and ascertain the facts. They also say while they take actions to make sure errors will not happen again. Joining us now to provide additional insight on the evolving migrant situation, Congressman Mark Molinaro represents the 19th Congressional District here in New York State. Congressman, nice to see you. Thanks for coming on. Glad to be back with you. Thanks very much. So let's talk about the situation we the state finds itself in. This is something that New York City has been dealing with now. Upstate communities are dealing with it as well. And a lot of folks are saying they're kind of reaching a breaking point as how these people are going to be housed, how they're going to be taken care of. From where you sit in D.C., how has it been playing out on your end? Yeah, I, I, I want to challenge the context. New York isn't finding itself here. New York knew this is where we would we would end up, and a failure to act in a compassionate and responsible and competent way has now produced a crisis of significance, humanitarian crisis that extends from the borders, uh, American borders uh, with with Mexico, into upstate communities. Uh, this is a failure to plan, a lack of leadership, and an unwillingness to confront the very need to be compassionate about how we handle, address, and, and care for human souls. And, and sadly, this crisis now uh, is, is, is really put, not only undermining communities, uh, but it's, it's, it's really putting at risk the very human lives that, uh, that deserve compassion and care. We've been reporting a lot recently on what seems, at least from our position, to be a lack of communication all around, whether it's government in the city, county governments, the state level, dealing with this company that we keep referring to as, as DocGo that is, seems to have been contracted to help get these people around and get them to where they need to be. Is that something that you see has been an issue as well? Why is there this lack of communication? There's a lack of communication because there's a lack of competence and a commitment by the city of New York and the state of New York York to lead. Uh, we had this kind of, I talked to Mayor Adams several times early on in this process, spoke to the governor. There needed to be uh, months and months ago, very clear communication and then a coordination with, the, in particular, those communities or counties that wanted to be helpful. I did this for 12 years. As a mm -hmm. county executive, my responsibility was through the federal and state process to identify shelters, in particular for unaccompanied minors, and there's a coordinated effort. This, this is a crisis of their making. This is a lack of coordination out of their incompetence. And, and it's putting at risk, again, undermining communities, but also the very human souls, some of whom are coming to America because they see us as the, as the beacon of light and hope and opportunity that we are. Uh, but, but the president hasn't addressed the crisis at the border. Uh, uh, states are making choices they, that I don't think are, are, are logical either. The federal government moving people into cities like New York. And then New York just trampling on, uh, on the responsibilities and rights of upstate counties. All of this could, can still be corrected, but could have been avoided if there was competence, compassion, and coordination uh, from the city and state uh, uh, months and months ago. You sponsored a, a bipartisan bill in the House last month that passed the, the Schools Not Shelters Act. And I know that was in regards to one of the plants that Mayor Adams had there in New York City to house some of these folks in school gymnasiums. 
Yeah, I mean, this was a, a, you know, a failure uh, to plan as a plan for failure. So you had the city converting schools. In fact, one in Brooklyn uh, set off uh, so many alarms in the neighborhood. The very communities, by the way, uh, single moms and dads who uh, and, and families who have children reliant on free lunch and breakfast programs during the summer, athletic programs uh, towards the end of the year, and kids like my own with disabilities go to those school buildings uh, for services throughout the, the, the end of a school year into the summer, having to be relocated in order to accommodate uh, shelters. And now you have thousands upon thousands of people living on the streets or, or, or now being uh, transported to upstate communities. Again, um, and, and DACO is, is, is just the tip of the iceberg. This was a contract that wasn't uh, uh, vetted, it wasn't competitive, it wasn't transparent, and now there's a lack of oversight, and you're seeing it in communities like Albany County, but others, where where there should be this, this coordination and care for the very human souls being relocated, and there's none of that. But again, it starts at the border, and, and, and Republicans and Democrats, by the way, both extremes of Republicans and Democrats in New York have said the president should have declared a state of emergency. There should have been federal resources made available earlier. The governor should have demanded greater oversight and communication from the city. And I do, I do uh, put uh, a great deal of responsibility on Mayor Adams, who committed to communicate with counties in a very coordinated fashion. And that, of course, isn't occurring. And we're seeing now, you know, a lot of the young children that have found themselves through no fault of their own here with their parents, the state now trying to get them an education. And the communication yep. with, with DACO seems to have straightened itself out, at least in some of the districts here upstate. They've begun the enrollment process to get these kids uh, in a classroom at the start of the school year. Yeah, I mean, first, just uh, individuals coming into communities and having to make that transition, which, sure. again, is what I did for 12 years. Social services departments right. work with federal agencies to make sure that there's that process. English as a second language is established, and there's some financial support. All of that failing, now you have this, uh, this private entity. Again, no vetting, no transparency, and lack of oversight that's supposed to be coordinating. We know that that isn't occurring in every instance. But at the end of the day, remember, these are human souls. These are young kids who do deserve care. Now, it should have happened at, at, our, at our southern border. The federal government should have stepped in. The president and White House should have taken action. At this point, though, where there are communities that are trying to coordinate, there needs to be a much better uh, a job. But, but this, is a, this is a failure to plan. And, and I mean that sincerely, a failure to plan. And now we have a plan that is utterly failing. You've been on a tour, from what I understand, around the state since you've gone on August recess here. What are you hearing from people, uh, Mark, in the, in the communities you've been visiting the past couple of weeks? And how are they reacting well, you know, to this? Yeah, on this topic in particular, this is one more example of upstate communities feeling as if they're neglected, overlooked, or taken advantage of by downstate interests. Now, I, I always joke that the 19th district is where upstate meets downstate, and it is. But the communities that I've lived in, that I communicate with, that I serve, that, 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 uh, that I now represent uh, all across the, the 19th district, they do feel like they're being taken advantage of and treated as sort of lesser partners in a state uh, that, quite frankly, they deserve uh, the same respect and the same consideration. Uh, and so that does come up quite often. We know that there, there are, are serious concerns, and it's one of the reasons I continue to press the state and federal agencies to really step in, again, in a compassionate and caring way mm -hmm. to ensure that we're providing protection in our communities and care for these human souls. And hopefully, again, someday soon, everybody here is going to get on the same page. Congressman Mark <laughs> Molinaro, thank you, as always, for your time. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Be well. State Park System is a year out from celebrating its centennial. When we come back, speak with an official of the State Parks, the commissioner himself, to talk about the past, present, and future of New York State Park System. And remember, as always, if you've got a comment or story idea, please let us know. Email news at news10.com or reach out on Twitter at WTEN. Back to Empire State Weekly. I'm Ryan Peterson here in Albany. The State Parks Department getting ready to mark its centennial. And this week, we're getting a preview of what's set to be a year-long celebration in 2024. Next year, state parks across New York will host celebrations, performances, other events to mark 100 years of the state parks system. In addition, the state will implement over $200 million capital improvement projects 
over the course of five, each year over the course of five years. Additionally, a plan will be developed to address climate change and move the parks to renewable energy by the year 2030. And joining us now to continue our discussion about that centennial is the Commissioner for the Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation, Eric Kulisade. Commissioner, nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Ryan. Happy to be here. So let's talk about this big celebration planned for next year, but you got things kind of started in earnest earlier this month with, with a tour, tour and some things you did. I had uh, last week, uh, in order to draw attention to the centennial, sure. you're right, it's next year, I did a, I barnstormed the state. <laughs> Uh, went to uh, 10 parks in two days. Uh, awesome. Started here in the Capital District, went down the Hudson River, uh, out to Long Island, to Jones Beach. We finished that afternoon at Lone Jones Beach uh, after having been to Alana, Lake Welch, Harriman, and uh, walk away over the Hudson. And then flew to Buffalo. And that night, I uh, lit, the, lit the lights on the American Falls, green and gold, in honor of the nice. centennial. Uh, that next morning of uh, day two, I, um, I shot a cannon at, uh, at, at Old Fort Niagara. It's one of our historic sites up along the Niagara River in Lake Ontario. I, I'll tell you, uh, the Canadians surrendered. Happy to, they're Excellent. now ours. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, but then went back to the hurricane deck. I don't know if you've been there. It's an opportunity you actually can stand underneath the American Falls. So I went to the hurricane deck. Never I went to Gananig, I went to Gananigan, which is one of the very few um, uh, state, uh, really statewide, nationwide state of historic sites dedicated to Native American history and culture. To Beautiful. Uh, Seneca uh, went kayaking at Green Lakes and finished up the finished up the trip at SPAC. Welcome to the, Phil welcome the Philadelphia Orchestra for their 50th. And did some lifeguarding too. And from what I understand, uh, your history with the department goes back quite a ways. Yes. There, there was no way that I wasn't going to do this <laughs> trip without stopping at Lake Welch. Lake Welch is sort of a, it's a lake beach down in the New York metropolitan area. And I was a lifeguard there in 1982. It awesome. was my first real job. And here I am as commissioner. I did do other things for a while, but. Uh, I'm sure. So let's talk about the park system, right? This is, you and I were just saying before we get on camera here that it's extensive. There's really nothing else like it in the country as far as state resources go. Um, I said to you, I think a lot of people here in New York State take it for granted and may not realize how unique it actually is. I think, you, I think the, uh, the, the New York State park system stands out across the country, right? Um, we have uh, we all the best assets, unlike other states, you know, the Grand Canyon, other, other states with these national parks, all the great parks in New York are state owned because New York got into the park business before any other state. So as a result, we have 250 parks and sites. We have a lot of infrastructure, a lot of historic infrastructure. So that's expensive to maintain, but also it was, it speaks to these aspirations. New York's always wanted to be at the, at the, at the top of things. And, and I think our park system speaks to that. You know, Jones Beach has got that iconic Robert Moses waterfront on the South Shore of Long Island, right? The best beach in America, the most popular beach in America. Uh, so I think um, it, it's an amazing system uh, and, 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 and has all, we have really owned all of New York's best places. And because of the centennial celebration next year, the state has pledged a lot of money over the next few years. In fact, if I'm remembering correctly, about a billion by the year 2028 will have been reinvested into the park. We have a five-year capital plan at $200 million a year, and I take my hat off to Governor Hochul. Governor Hochul. Uh, uh, actually talks about herself as being a real parkie. Uh, she spends nights at our park. She, she, uh, she's regularly, when she's looking for a little time off here in the Capital District, mm -hmm. she'll go to Alana or someplace just to relax for a while. So uh, we're fortunate to have really a great advocate for our parks and the governor herself. And yes, so 200 million a year is allowing us to really step up and take on the, um, the uh, years of underinvestment, right? We have mm -hmm. had we had decades of underinvestment, and then we're finally able to address that and take places uh, like Niagara Falls and Jones Beach and turn them back into the iconic, iconic places they should. And, and coming out of the pandemic emergency, the park system had a record year, 2022, as far as number of visitors, right? Well over 70 million people. We are at 79 million. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're we're reaching for the 80 million <laughs> any day now. Uh, you know, I think it, it speaks to. Um, the investments we've made, right? The, the parks have had a great investment, 79 people, people a year, a million people a year. It's an enormous number. It compares to 55, just 15 million a year, 50, 15 years ago. Uh, and it just, it speaks to 
the investments we've been making, people who have higher expectations, mm -hmm. our campgrounds look better, our cabins look better, our hotels look better, our beaches are in great shape, our facilities, we have great food vendors that we're offering in a, a really vastly improved experience and it's showing in our numbers. And, and that many people though leads to things needing to be repaired, parks getting overrun perhaps in, in some instances. So that, that, that money that's being invested is gonna help that in a big it's way. It's all about, it's, we're yeah. even expanding capacity. We have a couple, we have a new park in New York City. We have a new park in Kingston that we're, that we're opening up pretty soon. Yes, we always have to be uh, mindful of our audience and managing people. But my goal as commissioner is, you know, we are, we are, we are built in, you know, we are built for, for um, high volume usage. We have, you know, enormous parking fields, big beaches, big infrastructure, and, uh, you know, we will we'll, we'll take all we can get. And one of the things I know that money will look at, too, is the effects of climate change. We've seen an awful lot of rain already this summer, and that has kept some parks like Bear Mountain, you were just saying earlier, closed so far this summer. Yeah, we, we we got walloped by by those storms at the beginning of uh, the beginning of the beginning of July that dropped. I think it was nine inches of rain on mm -hmm. West Point and Bear Mountains right next to West Point. That park was wiped out. Uh, we have to be thinking about the future, um, and it's not. And, and I think the great thing about being the park system is, you know, with 79 million visitors, we can model sort of the best behavior, the best practices for for the world we're moving into. And so, uh, by 2030, uh, we are going to be 100 percent. Uh, electrified with mm -hmm. renewable energy, uh, and we are looking at our shorelines. Obviously, we are the top number one shoreline owner in the state of New York, and it includes ocean waterfront and river waterfront. So we are exposed to, to climate change, sea level rise, uh, working on drainage, all these things. We have to be we have to be prepared because you know we have to be there. We have to be there to to provide a place for the people of New York to go. Is accessibility something you want to see increased as well? I'm really, uh, really driven with accessibility. I yeah. want to make sure, you know, as New York is increasingly diversifying, we need to, people need to be able to find a place where they feel comfortable, a home in our state mm -hmm. parks. I'm proud that in the last uh, couple of years, we've opened an autism nature trail at Letchworth State Park, the Grand Canyon of the East. It's a lovely place for people on the spectrum and their families to go without feeling uh, like they're under the spotlight, under the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comfortable place for people on spectrum. We are uh, beefing up our parks downstate in, in terms of the diversity is, is able to be reached. And then we're also just obviously, anytime we build something, we're thinking about ADA and, and, and uh, accessibility for people with disabilities. Commissioner Kulase, thank you so much for your time today. Great to see you. So much to take advantage of. If you're not, there's something near you wherever you're watching this show right now before the summer's out. Thank you, Ryan. It's a pleasure Thank to be you so here. Much. Come out and see you. All right, we do. The Department of Health renewing calls for state residents to protect themselves against respiratory illnesses. When we come back, we'll take a look at the recent data and the evolving response to COVID-19 and RSV. And remember, as always, if you got a comment or story idea, please let us know. Email news at news10.com. You can also reach out on, uh, well, what we call X now or Twitter <laughs> at WTEN. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm Ryan Peterson in Albany. As the school semester approaches, state health officials warn that we will see an increase in respiratory illnesses this fall. This as new data shows new cases of COVID-19 and RSV are on the rise. According to the state health department, over 700 people testing positive for COVID in July. That's the highest since April. At the same time, the department announcing plans to allow pharmacies to administer a new vaccine to treat RSV another respiratory illness which usually impacts infants and the elderly. The Department of Health recommends taking familiar steps to avoid the illness, including cleaning frequently touched services, wearing masks, getting vaccinated or boosted, and washing those hands. Looking ahead in September, there will be an increase in the tax imposed on cigarettes. Tax will be over $5 per pack as part of the efforts of the state to get people to just give up the habit. State of New York earmarks 76% of its cigarette taxes to health care, with the remainder going into the general fund here in the state. Last year, that tax brought in roughly $1 billion in revenue. The state already has the highest cigarette tax rate in the country. Experts sounding off on if the change will actually get people to quit. Fewer people will buy it. The, the real question is how many people? <laughs> and with something that's addictive, the answer is very few. <laughs> 
people will actually quit smoking because of this uh, $1 per pack tax increase. All right, stick around. We'll be back with a look at the week ahead in just a moment. Remember, if you got a comment, story idea, let us know. Email news at news10.com or find us on Twitter at WTEN. And finally, from us here on Empire State Weekly, this week marks one year since the Chips and Science Act was signed into law. Law provided federal incentives to build and expand semiconductor chips and their facilities here in the state. It was signed among a series of other state and national chips legislation. Governor Hochul releasing a statement on the one-year anniversary, crediting the act as well as other New York legislation with bringing, quote, economic opportunity to the state. Governor went on to say they'll continue to work to attract modern businesses and jobs to the state of New York. We'll continue to keep an eye on how the industry evolves here in the state. For now, from all of us on Empire State Weekly, I'm Ryan Peterson in Albany. We'll see you back here next week. Don't forget, you can catch us all over the state of New York. Here is the full schedule where you can find Empire State Weekly on 10 television stations across New York.